212. Let's stand and sing. Nothing but the blood. 212. Good morning. So good seeing you here today. Uh, we're going to try a couple things here. Ethan, you mind go ahead and close that door back there. Uh, and if it gets too warm in here, we're going to turn the air on. I think it's about 72, 73 right now. Some people are comfortable. Uh, but if we get a little too warm, we're going to turn the air on. Um, I tell you, it's been an interesting morning this morning, and uh, we've had some problems with our internet uh, and uh, other things that have been happening, and the devil, of course, we know he's the prince of the power of the air. Uh, what we ended up doing is I went ahead and preached over there this morning while Dave was doing Sunday school here. Uh, our live stream got started a little bit late because we were trying to get that fixed over there. Uh, couldn't get it set up. So now Dave's over there. He just got told he was going to be doing Sunday school over there. He's like, no, I'm done. I said, and I told him what happened. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, <I'm good. laughs> so I appreciate him doing that. And uh, so now he's doing the same lesson over there. And then I'll be preaching uh, over here the same message. But, you know, uh, this all kind of started uh, yesterday. We had, uh, it was a good shower. I appreciate all of you who came to the shower and uh, helped get that taken care of and, and decorated and everything for it. Uh, but uh, about the time the shower uh, started, uh, Beverly had called, and we need to pray for them. Uh, but Beverly, well, she didn't call. She came over to the house because my brain's going. My mouth is catching up here. Uh, but anyway, she came to the house, and she asked to pray for uh, Dale's uh, mother. And she, they said that she didn't think they would make it through the day. And it sounds like we got some birds that's going to be up here somewhere. We're going to hear that this morning, too. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> said pray for Dale's mother. Said she's not doing well. Do you think you can go see her sometime today? They're probably not going to make it through the day. And uh, they're down there right now with her. And so I said, yeah, sure, I'll run down there. And, uh, so I, I got dressed real quick and ran down to Blacksburg. And I was praying the whole way down there because I knew she wasn't saved. And uh, at least I'm pretty sure. And they didn't think she was saved either. But she didn't. She never wanted to give an opportunity for me to come by and talk to her. She wasn't uh, pastor friendly 
uh, at all. And uh, so I didn't know really what would happen. And I was just praying on the way down there. I said, Lord, just, you know, you work it out. Give me the words you want me to say. Uh, help me to, you know, just to do the right things. I don't know what I'm going to come across, but I pray you preserve her life until uh, she can trust you as her Savior. So anyway, I got to the nursing home. And uh, once I got in there, got into where the room was, uh, Dale and Beverly were in the room, and uh, his brother, uh, brother and sister-in-law were in there as well. And uh, so anyway, they introduced me, told me why I was there. So I just kind of got down because she had a hard time hearing. She was laying in bed, struggling, breathing, and I, uh, they told me to take my mask off so she could hear. So I pulled my mask down so I could talk to her and just started talking to her. And I said, well, let me, can I pray for you? Would that be okay? And, and they said they didn't think she could even respond. And, of course, she just kind of nodded her head uh, yes a little bit. So I prayed for her, and I prayed that God would give her the understanding to be able to be saved and uh, to know him as Savior. And then after I got done praying, I just went right into, uh, you know, the plan of salvation, told her about the love of God and how we're all sinners and, and Christ died for us. And, and went through the whole thing, and I could hear about the time I got started, I heard some commotion in the room, and I didn't know what was going on, and I heard a nurse talking, and I thought, as I was talking to her, I remember thinking, this is the rudest nurse I've ever you know, seen in my life, because usually when a pastor's in the room, they let you deal with the patient, and uh, they don't interrupt or anything. Well, she comes over, and she starts throwing a, a blood pressure cuff on her, and so I'm still just talking to her, and... I went ahead and I said, if you would like to accept Christ as your Savior, I said, pray a simple prayer like this. And I went ahead and prayed the prayer. And I had my head bowed as I was praying the prayer. And when I got done, I looked up and right there in front of my face was this nurse's face. And she's just looking at me like this, probably wondering what in the world am I doing? And I thought the same thing to her. It's like, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> and, uh, but I went ahead and asked Mrs. Tate there. I said, did you pray just now and accept the Lord as your Savior? And this time, the first time that she responded, it was just a little head nod. This time she was, it was a big head nod, and I could read her lips. She said, yes, I did. And so I prayed again and thanked the Lord for it. And then I let them go on and do what they were doing. They had a thing in there. They were ready to rush her to the hospital. And uh, Beverly uh, didn't know what was going on either. And she said something about she's dying. And I looked down, and... They thought maybe she coded, but she didn't have anything hooked up to anything. All she was on was oxygen. They didn't have anything in her, uh, nothing checking, any vitals or anything like that. Come to find out, after I had already left, because they were trying to get all this sorted out, after I left, found out those people were in the wrong room. You see how the devil works? I mean, I've dealt with distractions before, but never a distraction quite like that. And, uh, but I know this, that nurse, she heard the gospel. <laughs> I don't know if that was the first time she ever heard it. The look on her face told me it probably was. She probably didn't know what I was doing there. But, uh, you know, God is greater than anything that we could possibly imagine. And uh, I was, I, Beverly had contacted me this morning. I asked her to keep me updated with what's happening. Uh, they did put uh, Miss Tate on morphine this morning at 2. Uh, she said she's ready to go. Uh, she actually, I think it was one of her nieces that had passed away before, she said, uh, she called her by name, she goes, she's here to get me, but I can't get to her. You know, what's, what's holding me back? I can't get to her. Uh, I know she's coming for me, but I can't, I can't see her. And it was like she was welcoming, welcoming her, and then it wasn't long after that, she goes, oh, she's here. I'm ready to go, but I still, I still can't, I still can't go to sleep. She was waiting to go to sleep. And, uh. So anyway, just pray for them I, and the family. As far as the family's concerned, uh, they're ready for her to go. She's ready to go, and she's ready to go now. Thank the Lord for that. And uh, boy, I tell you what, it changes everything uh, when God. Uh, you know, sometimes we think this this person. I don't know how old she is. She's lived her whole life, and uh, sometimes people say, you know, that's a deathbed conversion. Do you think that's real? Why well, know this when they God sees the faith in that heart. It's real. It's real. It doesn't matter if it's on the deathbed. It doesn't matter if it's as a young child. It doesn't matter when it is. It's real. And those of us who know Christ as our Savior are going to see them again. And that's something we can rejoice over. And I praise the Lord for that.
But anyway, I wanted to share that with you, and, and uh, it was a blessing to my heart. But, uh, you know, I've, I was thinking all the way back, I was just rejoicing because we've been praying for her salvation for a while, and she's been on our prayer list for a while. But I'm thankful God worked that out, and I thought, you know, Lord, sometimes we doubt you and doubt how you're working. But uh, what I didn't tell you was she just got out of the hospital last night, and they were ready to call in hospice. And God worked out all the details to make all that happen. So I'm just thankful that it, it happened the way it did. And, and uh, But you pray for her that maybe today that she'll be able to go home and be with the Lord and, and be able to not suffer. That's what I've been praying. But uh, also I wanted to let you know, pray for Willie Akers. This is Daniel Akers' uh, brother. Uh, he's not doing well. And uh, they asked for a special prayer for him today. So we want to uh, pray for them also. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and stop right now. And we'll pray for these individuals. And then I'll give you a couple other announcements here. And then we'll have another song. Father, we come to you, Lord, asking that you will uh, be with uh, Willie Akers. Ask that you will touch his body and meet his need. And, Lord, I pray also for the spiritual need there. I don't know exactly what it might be. But, uh, Lord, I pray that if he's not saved, that you'll give him an opportunity to know you as his Savior. And uh, and then, Lord, I'm so thankful that, uh, Lord, you work things out there for Mrs. Tate. And, and uh, I pray that you give the family grace through this time right now and, and comfort their hearts. I know, uh, even though they know where she's going to be, Lord, this is still a sad time. It's still difficult. And I pray that you would just comfort them. And, and uh, Lord, there's others here in the church that have gone through similar things. And and, uh, Lord, it does make the days ahead sometimes difficult, but we thank you that you're the God of all comfort and you're the God of all grace and mercy. And uh, we just pray that you extend that mercy to them. And, Lord, we're thankful that those who are saved, that, Lord, when our loved ones have gone on uh, who know Christ and they've gone on before us, that, Lord, we are going to see them again. And that's something we can rejoice in. And, Lord, until you call us home, help us to be steadfast and unmovable and still abounding in your wonderful work that you've given us to do. And uh, Father, just help us be faithful. And I pray that you'll bless our service now <clears throat> and everything else that we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. A couple of announcements here. We are going to observe the Lord's Supper uh, tonight after the evening service, so please make a note of that. Uh, and then uh, next week is Mother's Day. So it's hard to believe that's our right around the corner. We're already through the month of April. This year's flying by. Uh, we're six weeks away from Cold Wars. So that's coming very, very quickly. And uh, anyway, next week <clears throat> we are going to have, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to have a, a special gift for our ladies. Uh, I'm still not sure how we're going to do the service. I'll probably put something on, <clears throat> excuse me, on Facebook and let you know if we're all, I would like us all to be in one building if we can, uh, but if we can all meet in uh, the church. I'll try to know something by Friday or Saturday. If you haven't heard from me and, and that makes a difference, a difference to you and you're wondering, uh, please give me a call and let me know because I'm not going to call everybody. I'll just put it on our Facebook page and then if you're wondering about it, uh, you know, just give me a ring or something and I'll let you know. But I'm just kind of praying about it. I think we're going to be in one building sooner rather than later. I keep watching our numbers each week in the state of West Virginia. They keep going down. The governor, I know, mentioned that he's waiting until 70% of the state's vaccinated. I think that's wishful thinking. I don't think that number's ever going to get there. Uh, but I'm thankful that the majority uh, of those who wanted to be vaccinated are being vaccinated. There's still some others that are uh, making that possible. And uh, But the virus numbers are coming down, and they're getting, they're very manageable. Uh, and, of course, they're with remdesivir and some of the other things that they weren't of the hydroxychloroquine they weren't allowing before, but now all of a sudden they are. Uh, when people get in a desperate need, um, those things we know do work. So uh, I know there's a few other variants out there that they're concerned about, but you gotta remember, uh, when you hear stuff on the media, their biggest thing is to keep you in fear. Because when you're in fear, they can control you. And that's, you don't think, you think I'm just telling you that to tell you that, but I'm not. I mean, we are living Kind of like what it was back in the days, uh, you know, of Nazi Germany. Uh, we're seeing things like this happen. History will always repeat itself when we don't learn from it. And it's starting to happen uh, here in our own country. And I'm not a doom and gloomer, but I'm just letting you know this is what's coming. I saw 
uh, there was a, a pastor in, uh, in Great Britain who was arrested. He's a street preacher. He was arrested because three people listening to him didn't like what he was preaching. They said he was preaching hate speech because he was reading Bible verses about homosexuality. They said, this is not the plan of God. It's a man and woman is the way God intended for it. And so they called the police. The police came, arrested the guy. That's in Great Britain. It's happened in Canada. It's happened in California. And I'm telling you, this is where we're going. So we want to be, we want to know where we're going to stand personally. Are we going to take a right stand or are we just going to follow the masses? It's going to be difficult to do what's right, but we all must purpose in our heart ahead of time and then ask God for the grace and strength to make, make the right decisions when the time comes. So, and no matter what happens, you know, if God, they come and they say, well, you can't have church service, we're going to arrest everybody who comes, you know, if that happens, they throw us in jail. Apparently somebody in jail needs to hear the gospel because that's what's going to happen. We're going to preach the gospel wherever we go. They can't shut you up. I uh, can't get you to be quiet. We're going to obey God in those situations rather than man. And we're going to do what's right. And uh, so anyway, we, we just need to be aware of the days and times in which we live. Pray for our leaders because God can direct and use our leaders whether they're saved or lost. Uh, they are the ministers of God to us for good even though they do evil things. Sometimes the evil things they do, it may be to get us more fervent about our Christian life. That would be a good thing. So God can use these things in ways we never thought possible. So we do need to pray for our leaders. That's what God commands us to do. So let's be doing that. Um, now, as far as after, uh, let's see, where did I leave off? Oh, one other thing I want to mention. Elizabeth, uh, she has a sign-up sheet for her wedding on June 12th. Uh, if you are planning to stay for the reception, we do need you to sign that list uh, by uh, what's the date? May 23rd. We need to know a number for food. There's 200 seats, I think, available inside the building. And then we need to know if there has to be a tent or something else set up outside. So if you can do that. Uh, now, if you're just going to go to the wedding, not stay for the reception, then uh, I don't think they need to sign that, do they? Okay. Um, that's what I told them over there this morning. So I wasn't sure if that was right. Uh, now, if you would like an invitation, put your name on the thing and just put, just need an invitation. There's a place there you can mark yes or no. Uh, but that way she can make sure you get that. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. We're going to do something a little different today. We haven't done this for a while. Actually, we're going to do a couple things different. And I, I should have probably told Elizabeth. But we're going to do, we haven't done our pledge and national anthem for a while. So let's do that this morning. And then we're going to have a time of welcome. Now, let me say this with the welcome. If you don't want to shake hands, it's, people aren't going to think you're rude, okay? If you don't want to fist bump or give an elbow, if you just want to... Do kind of a wave like this, you know. Just do that, but just let folks know that you're you're happy to have them here. Now, let me say this. If you go up to somebody that has a mask on, uh, just respect their distance and their space. Don't get right up on them, please. Uh, we want to respect that distance and space. But just what we're going to do is we're going to greet a few folks, maybe three or four folks, and just let them know you're glad we're here, and, uh, and they should tell you the same thing, and then we'll have our offering after that. So let's all stand. We're going to do our pledge, our national anthem. Okay. All right, let's pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
folks around you, and then we'll have our ushers come and uh, take up our offering. back to going. It's good to get a chance to fellowship with one another and uh, good having God's people together where we can talk and fellowship. That is such a huge need in the church. And uh, we're going to pray. You know, we were talking in the deacons meeting yesterday. We had, uh, you can be seated, I'm sorry. I should have told you that. We were talking in the deacons meeting yesterday. We had uh, Jody, Jared, Johnny, and Joey and we said, well, Mike, you're the only one that's not. And he goes, well, my first name's John. And you're like, well, you're the only one that's left out, Pastor Walt. I said, well, I'm a junior. <laughs> and now we've got two Johnnies up here. <laughs> I'm going to ask John if he'd mind coming praying for our offering, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, God. And we thank you for this opportunity to give you back just a small portion of all the blessings you give us, God. I pray that you'll take this offering, that you'll use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom, God, and that as members of this church will be good stewards of your money. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn number 441. A stand and sing, Love Lifted Me. 441.
have a special today. I didn't look at the list to see. I didn't know if we had one. Didn't want to take it from somebody. So I wanted to mention to you also, uh, if you can help with the playground on short notice, uh, as far as you know, some things that we may need. It might some things we might need might take maybe 30 minutes to an hour. Some might be longer, but if you can put in any time at all. Uh, if you would just let me know, uh, I'm going to make a list of those folks that I can call. At maybe if you say, okay, I'm available afternoons or I'm available mornings or whatever, uh, because some things we're going to have to do, we can't just have a work day. We're going to try to have a main work day to get the rest of the big stuff done, but there's other little things that need to be done uh, on that, and it might just need a few people to kind of put something in place, fasten it together, and, uh, and do that. So if you can do that, please let me know. Uh, sometime today or you can you know think about it and then uh, shoot me a message on Facebook or text me or something like that uh, I would appreciate it the uh, the mulch is supposed to be in the week of May 24th I haven't heard yet on the swing set yes the communion we will have it in here and uh, I'm hoping we can get our internet fixed this afternoon, whatever the problem was, and then we'll have one of the deacons over there in the building uh, and just for the people who will come over there. So, um, But as far as the playground and the swing set, I haven't heard when that's supposed to be in, but we're going to try to get it functional before Polo Wars. That's the goal uh, where we can actually use it. Uh, the fence and everything won't be up by that time, but... Uh, we will try to get the rest of it done. So if you can help with that at all, please let me know. Um, all right, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 22. First book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 22. And I figured the reason all of this stuff happened uh, that it did today is because the devil was fighting this message to try to get my mind cluttered and clouded to where I couldn't think uh, or anything. So I went ahead and preached this this morning over there. Uh, I didn't get to cover everything I wanted to cover, but I just covered the main things because I only had about uh, 20 minutes. Um, now, if you hear some cars and stuff in the parking lot, please don't uh, be distracted because they're probably going to finish over there in about 10, 15 minutes because uh, they did the Sunday school class over there. So they started a little bit sooner. They didn't have a Sunday school opener, so they got started a little bit sooner. So they'll be finishing up here shortly. So if you hear that, that's probably what's going on. Um, but Genesis chapter 22, we see a familiar story here in the scriptures. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole story. This, this was kind of one of the stories the Lord led me to. There's a lot of examples I could have pulled from the scriptures for the topic I'm going to preach on, and again, I think the devil just obviously does not want us to hear uh, this message because this affects every area of our life. Every decision that we make in life is going to be hinged on what we do right here with this message. Uh, doesn't matter if it's a major decision, doesn't matter if it's a minor decision, and the title of the message, <clears throat> the title of the message is simply when God's will doesn't make sense. When God's will doesn't make sense. Sometimes God's will in our life does not make logical sense to us. But he still expects us to obey and follow through. Here in this these first couple of verses we're going to read here, we see the story of Abraham and what happened to Abraham. And God told Abraham to do something that if we're just kind of casual readers of the Bible, we read through the story and we think, oh, that's a nice story. But what we fail to forget, or what we fail to remember, let me say it that way, <laughs> what we fail to remember is that Abraham was a real person. And this was a real decision. And he didn't know the outcome. But he had to trust God. That's what we need to remember. So here in Genesis chapter 22 and verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Now that word tempt there does not mean, we know the Bible uh, teaches us that God does not tempt us with evil. He doesn't tempt any man. He does not tempt us to sin. 
That word tempt there actually means he tested or proved Abraham. Now, God does test and prove us. And the reason he does that so many times is because we don't know our own hearts. And God is trying to reveal to us what is really in our heart. And that's why we're tested and proved. But that's what it means here. It says that he tempted Abraham, and it said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now there's a lot of things we can look at in this story, but we're told there, Take thine son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. You know, if he had hated this child, and of course Isaac at this time was not a young child. Isaac was probably a young man, probably in his 20s at this time. Knew full well what a burnt offering was. Knew full well what a sacrifice was. But did not know what God had told his father. They have to make a journey to Mount Moriah that this journey uh, takes roughly about three days to get there. Uh, he take, Abraham takes his son Isaac and a few of his servants, and they make this journey together. And as they get there on this journey, I don't know if there was conversation. We're not told what the conversation might have been. But I am sure as a father, this weighed heavily on Abraham's heart. But Abraham trusted God. He believed God. We're going to see some scriptures here in just a moment. But it says here, take thy son, thine only son, Isaac. You say, well, I thought Abraham had another son. He did. He did have another son that was 12 years older than Isaac. But he was not the promised seed. And we'll see why here in just a few moments. You see, God had given Abraham a promise that even though he was an old man and his wife was an old lady, that they were going to have children that were going to be as the stars of the sky. And Abraham said, how is this possible? There's a servant born in my house, and he is my heir. How can our children be as the stars of the sky? And God had given this promise. Years had gone by after that promise was given. Sarah, who knew about the promise, saw that she was still barren, still didn't have any children, she told Abraham, and this is one time that, that she, he should not have listened to his wife. Now, I want to say this. At the end of this message, I'm going to tell you, men, when you should listen to your wife. This was a time he should not, and here's why he should not have listened. Whenever your wife or if you're a woman and your husband, when they tell you to do something that is clearly against God's principles, that's when you obey God rather than man. Does that make sense? Sarah said, why don't you take my handmaid and go in unto her and maybe God will give you a child by her. Abraham was convinced maybe this is what needed to happen. So he listened and he should not have. And he went into Hagar and she became pregnant and had a son. His name was Ishmael. This is where the Arab nations come from today. And ever since this time, we've had the Arab-Israeli conflict going on. And it will continue to go on because of that one decision right there. He tried to circumvent the will of God. After all of that takes place and 12 years go by, God says... You're going to have a child. Sarah heard this. She was way past years now, and, and she laughed in her heart. And God said, yep, this time next year, you're going to have a son. And Isaac was born. Abraham, I think, at the time was 100 years old. Sarah, I think, if I remember correctly, was 90. I didn't go back and double-check that. But they were well past childbearing years. And then some time goes on after this, and there are several years that pass. And then God tells Abraham, I want you to take your son, the promised son, the heir, the seed of promise. Matter of fact, if you turn and look at Genesis 21 and verse number 12, 
It says, And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. And, and what happened here was God sent Hagar and Ishmael away. He sent them away. God had Abraham send them away. And he says, Don't be grieved because of them. He says, In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And then God himself refers to Isaac as Abraham's only son, Isaac. When God's will doesn't make sense, what do we do? That's what we're going to look at here this morning. It's actually a pretty simple message. But I want you to be thinking about things because there are a lot of decisions we make in life that we make the wrong way. And God wants us to fix it because he wants us to know what's in our own heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. I pray that you will speak to us and speak through me, Lord, as only you can. I pray, Lord, that you will direct our time together now. And Lord, we, we truly want to give you thanks for just the blessings of each person that's able to be here today. And, and uh, just the blessings we have to be able to gather together and worship you. May we never, ever take that for granted. One day, Lord, it may not, we may not have that freedom. We may have to meet in secret, in private. But, Lord, we still want to obey the word of God. Father, I pray that you will help us as we hear this message this morning. I pray that you'll bind the powers of darkness that will try to rob the seed of the word of God out of our hearts. I pray that you will keep any distractions away. I pray that, uh, Lord, you will help our minds not to wander on things that we'll be doing here in the next 20, 30 minutes and getting ready for lunch and other things. But Lord, here for the, just the next few minutes, we will focus and we will be ready to hear what you have for us today. Father, we ask that you might receive the glory and honor for all of this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We see here what God told Abraham. He says, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and I want you to offer him for a burnt offering. Over in Hebrews 11, we often call this passage here, we call it the Hall of Faith. The Hall of Faith. You don't have to hold your place there in Genesis. We're not coming back there. Hebrews 11. And we see several characters mentioned in Hebrews 11. And we see Sarah mentioned here. We see also Abraham Mentioned, and we see this part of the story in Hebrews 11 and verse 17. And listen to what it says here. It says, by faith Abraham, when he was tried. Now again, this is where God proved him. God tested him. When he was tried, he offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, what was Abraham thinking through all of this? They make the journey to, the, to Mount Moriah. As they make the journey to Mount Moriah, he tells the servants, I want you to stay here. I and the lad are going to go yonder and worship. They go up on the mountain. They make the journey. And Isaac's a bright young man. He knows they're going to offer a burnt offering, but he says, Father, where is the burnt offering? We have no lamb. Abraham says God will provide himself a lamb. Now I think that was foretelling what Jesus Christ was going to do, that himself was going to become the lamb of God. But I believe also what Abraham was saying, because we really don't know what he was thinking this whole entire time until we get here to Hebrews 11 and verse number 19. That's when we start finding out exactly what he was thinking through all this. Look at verse 19. It says, Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. He, he believed all this time he was going to have to kill his son. He was going to have to offer up Isaac, his only son, whom he loved. He was going to have to lay him, bind him, lay him down on the altar, raise the knife above his head, and slay him, and allow God to burn up the sacrifice. And then somehow, some way, that didn't make sense to Abraham, 
God was going to raise him from the dead. Because he knew this. God had promised that Isaac was the promised seed. You see, sometimes God's will doesn't make sense to us. We can rationalize it. We can think about the pros and cons. We can think about all of the stuff that goes on in our mind. But it simply does not make sense. We find examples of this all through the scriptures. I think of the Red Sea crossing when the children of Israel, when they fled out of Egypt. And the Bible says God led them through the way of the wilderness. And that means that when they got there and they were walking down the valley between two mountains, they knew the Red Sea was in front of them. There was no escape. They knew the Egyptian army was behind them. They knew Pharaoh hated them. But yet God led them to the Red Sea. They didn't know what was going to happen. They had no idea. As a matter of fact, some of the people did what you and I probably would do. They started to complain. Moses, what did you do? You have led us here. We are now trapped. We, the land has us trapped here. We can't go forward because of the Red Sea. We're trapped by these mountains. There's no escape. The Egyptian army's behind us. You brought us out here to die. And what did Moses tell him? He just simply said what God told Moses. Moses had to believe the promise. He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. They didn't know what God was going to do with the Red Sea. We did because we know we were on the other side of it. But you think about it. You put yourself in their situation. How scared would you have been? How concerned would you have been? Would you have trusted the promise of God and say, well, I don't understand what's happening, but I know this. God led us here. So whatever's going to take place is going to have to be something wonderful. It's going to have to be for the glory of God. Somehow God's going to get the glory through all of this. I think of Joshua when he fought the battle of Jericho. Joshua is told by God, I want you, when you go to fight this fortified city, I mean, this city was so fortified, the walls of the city were so thick, they, they could have, they the, were told by historians, they could have chariot races on the wall. That's how thick the walls were. And the Israelites have really no weapons of warfare to speak of. And God says, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to march to the city, go around the city one time, and come back. And I don't want anybody saying a word. That doesn't make sense, does it? What good is that going to do? But God didn't stop there. He says, I want you to do that the second day. And the third day. And the fourth day. And on, you keep doing this. And on the last day, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and march around the city. And this time, don't just do it one time. I want you to march around seven times. And on that seventh time when you stop, that's when I want you to give a shout. You're going to hear the sound of the trumpets. You're going to give a shout. And then you're going to go forward and conquer the city. They had no idea the walls were going to fall down flat. They had no idea as what God was going to do. But they, at some point, they had to trust God and obey. What do we do when God's will doesn't make sense? I think of Mary and Joseph. Mary, who is a virgin. She's told by an angel that she is now pregnant with a child. She says, how can this be? I've never known a man. And then she's told that that child is of the Holy Ghost. And that little babe, what it's going to do, that it is a holy child. It is the heir. It is the, the promised seed that was promised through the whole Old Testament. And he's going to be the savior of the world. At some point, she had to believe God. She was probably concerned what her soon-to-be husband, Joseph, was going to think of this. Joseph was then told about what was happening. And he knew that Mary had been with child and, and he was a good man and a just man and was, didn't want to make a public example but just wanted to put her away, the Bible says privately, just kind of quietly. He could have had her stoned to death. But he was a good man, just man, a merciful man. And then an angel comes to him and says, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that thing which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Does that make sense? Has that ever happened before? At some point, he had to decide to trust and obey. 
What do we do when God's will doesn't make sense to us? Would we find our name written in Hebrews 11 in the Hall of Faith? Because we ourselves, when we were tempted, when we were tested, we trusted God and obeyed. So what do we do? Well, there's first of all, in the message, the introduction is about as long as the message. The message is actually pretty short. There's a choice that needs to be made. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. There is a choice that needs to be made. These are some common verses that we read all the time. I quote these all the time. I love these verses. These verses mean a lot to me. And I hope they do to you as well. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 5. We must realize that when God's will does not make sense, there is a choice that needs to be made. <clears throat> Notice what it says here. I hear a few more pages turning. Give you a second to turn here. Proverbs 3 and verse number 5. It says, trust in the Lord. Now, it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't have a period after that. It says, trust in the Lord. And then it tells us how. Trust in the Lord with what? All thine heart. You can't trust him with half a heart. You can't trust him... With 99.99% of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And then do what? Lean not on thine own understanding. You see, we have to realize that when it comes to finding the will of God, and when God says, here's what I want you to do, and you're like, that's what you want me to do? Are you sure, Lord, that's what you want me to do? That doesn't make any sense. When God's will doesn't make sense, we need to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. You see, you're going to have to decide, Lord, is this your will or does this thing just simply make sense to me? I need to know the difference. Some people are going to miss out on seeing the wonderful works of God because they lean too much on their own understanding. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to, you're going to miss the blessings of God. That doesn't mean you're going to miss seeing some of the works of God, but you're going to miss out on that Red Sea experience. You're going to miss out on your Jericho experience. You're going to miss out on your Mount Moriah experience because there's going to be something that's going to be too hard for you to believe, and you're going to lean too much on your own understanding, and that's where you're going to make the mistake. God will still bless you because he loves you. Heard a wonderful message Friday night. Went to hear Brother Nate preach up there at Preacher John's Church. Great message on the grace of God. Oh, wonderful message. God's grace is amazing. That was one of the songs we sang over there this morning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. God's grace is amazing. We don't deserve it. It's amazing. It's wonderful. But God wants us to trust Him with all of our heart and lean not unto our own understanding. The battle is going to be between your will that makes perfect sense to you. It makes total sense. Or it might give you security. Or it might give you comfort. Or it might even give you love or friendship. But it makes total sense. It's going to be a choice between that and and a choice between what God wants that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. That's where you apply the verse. That's where you're going to have to put your feet where your heart's supposed to be. And you're going to have to apply it to your life. We cannot trust God halfway. We have to throw our own understanding out the window. So how do we do this? When we have a decision to make, we often consider the pros and cons. Now, some of you in here are like me. You're a planner. I plan things. Sometimes I overplan. Others, like I always get tickled when I think about the playground out here and how we kind of threw up the playground. I had planned that thing out. I mean, I had that thing mapped out. It was lined up with the side of the building here. Everything was taking place. And, and I was trying to figure out exactly how deep this hole, the first hole, needed to be. And we were doing it. We had a bunch of guys out there like, well, let's just throw it in here and do this, and then uh, we'll start putting it together. If we need to fix it, we'll fix it. And I'm like, okay, if you think that'll work. And you know what? It got done. And it looks great. And we got away, and Jared was kind of laughing. He says, 
We're probably going to, and I said, I think if we do this, if we don't do it right, we're going to be about, I think it was six inches short on the very end of that thing. And when we got all said and done, that's about how far we were, about six inches. You see, the planning, that was my planning. But you know what? The thing got done, and it was accomplished. I had to trust them, but they also had to trust me that I had the thing mapped out right. At some point, we had to trust somebody. But you know what? Ultimately, we have to trust God no matter what we do in life. We have to trust God with everything. So how do we apply these things to our life? When there are decisions we make, we often consider the pros and the cons. And what usually determines our decision, if there are more pros than cons, we're like, okay, this must be God's will. Wrong way to do it. That's why most of us don't make God's will a part of our life each and every day. Because we are doing it the wrong way. It is not even about the pros and cons. You see, the Bible tells us our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. We can line up those pros and cons and say, okay, this must look good if I do this and not this. Because the pros are way outweighing the cons over here. So it must be God's will. But let me tell you what you probably need to do. You probably need to do what I've had to do many times. You have to be honest with yourself if you do this, though. Because our hearts are deceitful. You can lie to yourself and believe it. You have to take those pros and turn them into cons. And take the cons and turn them into pros. And then start thinking about that decision. I'm going to give you a couple examples here. Let's say you're thinking about marrying somebody. And this person that you're, you're getting ready to marry has all kinds of money. I mean, they've got it coming out their ears. They've got a private jet. They've got, you know, six Lamborghinis. I mean, they just got so much money, they don't know what to do with it. And you are in love. And you think, man, this person is definitely who God wants me to marry. But then someone accuses you and says, I know why you're marrying them. You're just marrying them for their money. No, I'm not. I love them. How do you know? Well, you need to do this. You take the pros of the financial security and turn it into a con. What if they lost everything overnight? Now, this is where you have to be honest with yourself. If they lost it all, they lost their job, they lost their security, they have no talents and abilities, would you still be able to love them for richer, for poorer? What if they lost their health and they couldn't do the things that helped make that money. And they had to spend their fortune on their health. Is it still God's will? You see how you have to turn that around a little bit? Here's another, another example. Let's say that your business offers you a promotion in another city. Somebody somewhere down in Texas or wherever. And they say, we're going to double your salary. Maybe it's Florida. They, we're going to double your salary if you move. And you look in the area and you find that there's no good church anywhere close to you. But your salary is going to be doubled. You pray about it. You say, well, you know, I was praying that I would get a raise at work. You know, maybe this is what God's doing. And you, what, you're taking the pros and cons. Well, let's switch those things around. What if that salary was not double your salary? What if it was only half of your salary? And there was a really good, solid church in the area. Is it still God's will for you to go? Be honest with yourself. If you say no, then you're leaning too much on your own understanding. You see how that works? How easy the devil deceives us? How easy our own hearts deceive us? Let me give you another scenario. There are two, there's a couple, a married couple, and they're trying to figure out how to make ends meet. They decide that both of them need to work outside the home in order to get by. So they work outside the home, and, and uh, they have, say they have 16 children, and they're like, man, you know, we've got to do something to, to feed these kids. We, we both have to make this work. These 16 children are going to eat us out of house and home. We've got to make, the only way we can do this is both, and then not only do we have to have one job, we have to have two jobs. You're weighing the pros and the cons. Let's switch that thing around. What if God said, well, I want the wife to stay at home to train the children? 
And I just want the husband to have one job, not two. Your jaw drops. How are we going to make it? When God's will doesn't make sense, what are you going to do? You take the pros and cons. It could be that in that scenario, God might know that if you choose to do his will, and the husband only has one job, and you suffer financially for years and years and years, that could have been the very thing your children needed to see and grow up in to make them the servant of God that they would become. But if you do it the other way and lean on your own understanding, they can have security. They can have clothes on their back and things taken care of and have plenty of food. But maybe the last eight of those 16 children just don't turn out for God because they end up being a little too spoiled. I'm just telling you, we need to stop and think about things. When God's will doesn't make sense. Let me give you one more scenario. Let's say you're planning to have three children. You think, okay, well, and, and we do this. We all think this way. I know I thought this way. I thought, how many kids can we afford to have? And Becky and I were talking about it before we were married, and I think, I don't remember what the number, I think it was 12 children she was talking about. And I was just like, okay. <laughs> I'm marrying somebody who's psychotic. <laughs> and I was like, well, okay, I think eight probably would be a good number. I honestly thought about four or five. I thought, yeah, well, we grew up with six. Okay, six is kind of pushing. Guess what we ended up with? <laughs> six. She had six miscarriages. She got her 12. You know, she got her 12 children. We got six in heaven. And, uh, but, you know, I was sitting there thinking, and I thought this, Lord, how are we going to do this financially? And then we talked about what is she going to do uh, after these children are born? And I thought, well, somewhere along the line, we're going to have to provide for them. But you know what? I knew in my heart what God wanted us to do, and it didn't make any sense to me. I knew God wanted her to stay at home. I knew God wanted her to train the children, and I was going to be the only income. And I remember I, at the time when we got married, I was a youth pastor. I was making 12000 a year. This is back in the late 90s, making 12000 a year. And then God led us to another church. And that year, and it was a matter of fact, it was the year 2000, our income was $7,000. We weren't on government assistance. We didn't have anything like that. And I'm telling you what, there were times of desperation in our home. But I knew as God's will, we were where we were, doing what we were supposed to be doing. And you know what I saw? I saw my Jericho. I saw my Red Sea experience. I saw God prove himself and prove my own heart over and over and over again. But if I would have done it my way, I would have missed the blessings. God still would have blessed because I'm his child and he loves me. But I would have missed out on some of the greatest lessons God taught me. I would never, ever want to go back and do it again because we have so much uncertainty. It is difficult to get to that point to trust God with all of your heart. But I'm telling you, when you do it, it is worth everything. It is worth it all. So why should we trust God? God sees the bigger picture. He knows everything from eternity past. Before the foundation of the world, he knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to send his own son to the cross. He knew you and I were going to be born. We were going to be born sinners without hope and lost for all eternity if we did not accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. He knows everything. He sees the big picture. But the other reason we should trust God is because he knows a better plan. He knew he was going to part the Red Sea. He knew the walls of Jericho were going to fall down flat. He knew he was going to stop Abraham from killing Isaac. He knew that uh, Mary and Joseph was going to do a great job training their child, the son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew all of these things was going to happen. And another reason we should trust God is because God has a beautiful purpose for your life. Amen. A beautiful purpose. There is something God is trying to teach you in the will of God. So you can use that very thing to direct other people sometime later on and help other people in your life. 
and use it as a ministry resource if you will only let him do it. And I'm going to tell you, be honest with you, I'm not going to tell you about your lies. When you are in that time of trusting God, it's scary. I've told you about the time when we were, that year we made $7,000. Becky comes to me, I'm the provider, supposed to be the man taking care of the family. And she comes and she goes, I don't know what I'm going to do. We don't have any food in the house. The cupboards are bare. We lived on beans for a long time. You could buy a bat. I learned to love lentil beans. 63 cents a bat, a pound. They were awesome. We lived on those for a long time. Pinto beans, lentil beans, you name it. We, we were bean and soup people. She goes, there's nothing in the house. And I go and look in the cupboards. And I'm like, okay, let me see what's there. Look in the cupboards. Nothing. Open the refrigerator door. There's some formula. I'm not going to eat formula. That was it. There wasn't anything. Okay, I'll see what I can do about this. I go downstairs and I pray and pour my heart out to God and say, God, I'm a failure as a husband and a father. My family is going to starve. We don't have any food in the house. I don't know what's going to become of this. Lord, this is in your hands. This is We're doing what you want us to do. You said, come here, we came here. You said, do this, we've done this. But Lord, what is going to happen now? No sooner did I get done praying, our doorbell rang, and our pastor, who did not know how much we were suffering, did not know how much we, what we were going through, but our pastor came. He had one of those big, I think it was a Bonneville car, those big, huge trunks. And he said, I don't know what came over me, because it was just him and his wife, and then they had one daughter who was a teenager. He says, I don't know what came over me. I went to Sam's, and they had one sale after another, and I never do this. But I bought all this stuff that I never buy, and I need to find something to do with this food before I get home, and my wife's going to kill me. He's like, can you all use some of this food? And I went back and looked in the trunk, and, and I said, what are you talking about? He goes, all of this. Can you use it? It was name brand stuff we can never afford to get. I said, well, I think we could do something with it. God is so wonderful and so good. Did I know he was going to show up? No, nope, didn't have any idea. God knew he was going to show up. But God was proving me by me knowing my own heart. And he'll do the same thing for you. Let me give you a couple special situations here as I close. There's a couple. When we think about trusting God, we need to know how to handle these special situations because sometimes it's not just you yourself that need to trust God. It's you and somebody else. It's you and your wife. A husband and wife situation. How do you handle that? Well, let me say Genesis 2.24 says the two shall be one flesh. The two becomes one. When you're married, the two become one flesh. In James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, it talks about this. It says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, when it comes to a decision in your home, you better make sure you're both on the same page. Now, where is the exception? The exception is this. When one of you wants to do something outside of God's biblical principles, then that's when you obey God rather than man. You have to do something other than what your spouse wants to do because you want to honor God first. You can pray that God will take care of their heart, deal with their heart, take care of the situation, but that's the only time you don't be united in your decision. When you come together, you need to realize Amos 3.3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? There's a major decision. Sometimes God will use either the husband or the wife to kind of, they may not even be able to give you a good reason because you're looking at pros and cons. Well, why should we not do it? I don't know, but I don't think we ought to do this. It might simply be God has not told you, but he has told them because he is dragging their feet a little bit because it might be God's will, but it's not God's timing. We need to make sure we're on the same page. Here's another special scenario. We were talking about this yesterday, pastor and deacons, or a business partnership. If me as a pastor, because I'm the pastor, I'm gonna have to, I have to be responsible for everybody in the church. I have to give an account to God for everybody in the church. Even though that's true, I better be careful making decisions if all of the deacons are against it. Say, well, I'm the pastor. Bless God, I'm going to do it. Dangerous. I know a pastor, a great man. Great soul in her tender heart loves the Lord, 
but not always wise in his decisions. He's a very dynamic preacher, and he wanted to preach a message one time about hell, and he wanted to drive home the point to his people how serious hell was and how hot hell was and how if we really believed in a literal hell, it ought to motivate us to go out and tell the world about a burning place that they can avoid because of the love of God and the blood of Jesus Christ. And he said he wanted to drive home this point, and he asked his deacons, he says, I want to get up in church, and I want to scream the buildings on fire. Do you think this is a good idea? Now, first of all, it's against the law. But he said, the deacons are like, oh, pastor, I don't think that's a good idea. He said, oh, it, it'll drive home the point. He said, I'm going to preach on hell on Sunday, and I want the people to realize that if they believe this building was burning, that they're going to get up and do something about it. If we believe there's a little hell, a literal hell, that we're going to do something about it. He goes, I think it would be a great illustration. He said, Pastor, I don't think you ought to do that. He said, okay, I just wanted to ask you all for your opinion. Sunday came, guess what the pastor did? Scream the buildings on fire. There's a little old lady jumped up out of her seat. Had a heart attack, dropped on the floor. Other people running out of the building, trampling each other, bruising each other up on the way out. Things didn't go quite the way the pastor wanted. He had to go visit the, the lady who had the heart attack. Thankfully, she did not die. Visit her and her family. There was a lot of hurt feelings that day. They almost kicked him out of the church. He's lucky they didn't. You see, sometimes our will makes perfect sense to us. But God's holding it back through those around us that we're supposed to be in partnership with. Can two walk together except they be agreed? There's a reason we're supposed to have unity in things like that. But when it comes to you yourself, when it comes to your own personal life, are you willing to trust God with all of your heart and not lean at all on your own understanding? Do what I do many times. I take the pros and the cons and I just flip-flop them. And when I can flip-flop them and it makes a difference, then it wasn't God's will, it was my will. I told my mom... She worked in the church as a secretary for years and years and years, and she worked for this pastor who did not appreciate her. Never complimented her. She did a great job for him, and I don't even know if the guy was saved myself. It was a Baptist church, and she just didn't like working there anymore. She's like, I just can't stand working here. It's like, it just irritates me. We don't have a good working relationship. She said, I think I'm just going to retire from this. I said, well, do you think it's God's will? She said, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's God's will. And I knew the situation. I said, Mom, let me ask you this. What if next week that pastor retires? And they start looking for a pastor, and about a month they get a pastor in, and this pastor absolutely loves the things that you do in that office. He appreciates how you handle the finances. He appreciates how you do the bulletins and all the other stuff that you do in the church. And he just loves your work. Would you still want to retire, still want to quit? She says, well, no, of course not. I said, then it's not God's will. See how simple that was? I said, you're leaning on your own understanding. You don't know how God's going to change the picture. You don't know how he's going to work the circumstances out. But you just got to trust him. And I'm not telling you it's easy. The two most difficult things to do as a Christian, I believe with all my heart, is to trust and obey. They're difficult to do. But you'll be greatly rewarded if you do it. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you love us and that you're patient with us. And Lord, I pray that you help us, Lord, to trust you with all of our heart, that we lean not on our own understanding. Lord, there are so many illustrations and so many ways we could have looked at this and applied this. But Lord, there are so many decisions that we are making each and every day of our life. And, and I'm afraid, Lord, too often... We are not acknowledging you in all of our ways. We're acknowledging you in some, but not in all. God, will you help us? We don't know what the future holds, but we know the one who holds the future. And Father, I pray that you help us the next time we have a decision, which may be today, 
Whether it's a big decision, it might be something huge, it might be something little. Where we go to eat, where we're going to go grocery shopping. Help us, Lord, to acknowledge you in all of our ways and let you direct our paths. Because, Lord, you know the reason why you're leading us where you are and how you're directing us. Help us to trust you, Lord. May you bless the song of invitation. We ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 2.35. 2.35, we're going to sing a few verses. And God spoke to your heart, won't you come? Maybe there's just something that you just need to give to God. Maybe there's a decision you need to make. Maybe if you're not sure heaven's your home, we would love to show you from an open Bible how you can get that settled once and for all. Wouldn't you get it settled today? But whatever the need is, won't you come as we sing? I'm so thankful that God loves us and he's good and gracious to us. But you mark it down. Sometime this week, God's going to test us. He's going to put us to that test. And he wants us to always walk in the center of his will. He wants to direct our lives. But we have to acknowledge him in all of our ways and trust him with all of our heart. And again, I'm not telling you it's easy. I've been there many times and it is difficult to do. But you'll never ever, ever regret it. I've never met one person that ever has. God loves us. And he knows what is lying ahead. We just have to trust him that whatever it is, it's for our good and for his glory. Let's close the service here in a word of prayer. God bless you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. And uh, as we close here in prayer, I hope you have a great afternoon. Uh, be back in your place tonight. We are going to observe the Lord's Supper in here, and we will do it also in the other building. That's the plan anyway right now uh, if we get the Internet up and going. So let's close here in prayer, and I'm going to ask CA if he'd mind dismissing in prayer, please.